So we're coming to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And as we're going there, just consider if there's somebody who would like to open in prayer. Once we arrive, uh, I'll just pause for a moment and we will begin with prayer. All right, I believe we're all there. Is there somebody who'd like to open tonight? Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to go into your word, to hear what it is that you want us to hear. We pray, God, that you give us ears to hear and to listen and hearts to understand and to take it in and to retain it. Mm. We thank you, God, for the teacher. We thank you, God, that we can come to your house again and do our Bible study. And we pray that this goes out, Lord God, and it touches people. We just thank you, God, for who you are and for what you do for each, for each of us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, we're beginning in verse 32, and we're looking at 32 to 34. And we'll start with Jeanne. So we're looking at Samuel again tonight. Uh, the question was asked by somebody uh, before we began, what does Samuel's name mean? And it means, heard, God has heard us or heard of God. Yeah. That's what we're going to be putting our attention to again this evening as we look at another aspect of God himself in one of his names. and. His name first appears for the first time in the scriptures dealing with the account of Samuel. As we look at each one of these individuals and these groups of people, we're reminded of the fact that each of them did what they did, they trusted what they trusted, they believed what they believed by faith. And each time that faith is exercised, it it's always finds its foundation in Jesus. Even before the cross, it's always founded, set on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So again, Hebrews 12, 2, let's look to Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And then, of course, the, the reason for that, or the, way, the reason we're able to do that, is how that verse continues. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. He despised its shame or scorned the shame that was involved with the cross. But he set, he set his eyes, his focus, on what he was going to accomplish on the cross because he knew what that was going to accomplish for you and me. All of the promises of God found and find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So we're coming to look at Samuel and we want to look at the name of the Lord that is first revealed to us in the book of Samuel. And this is that name. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And as you're heading there, does anybody know what that name is? Not yet. All right. Well, we're going to find it out in just a minute. Pardon me? 
Uh, just one second, what's that? Sabaoth, Sabaoth. The question was, what is this name? So 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 3. There'll be another verse we're looking at in chapter 1 that's connected to this. So Louise, would you read verse 3 for us, please? And this man went out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli... Hophni and Phineas, the priests of the Lord, were there. All right, do you see? Um, do you see the name that's indicated there? They went up. The, this man went up from his city every year to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of. Hosts, or as we see here, the Lord Sabaoth. All right, so the Lord Almighty is in the NIV and some other um, translations like the ESV and so on. The Lord Almighty. But the word is Lord of hosts, it's the Lord Sabaoth. That is the word there. This is the first time that the word, the name, the Lord uh, of hosts, the Lord Almighty, Yahweh Sabaoth is what his name is in this reference. We're going to go down to one more passage, still in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to go down one more verse. We're going to look at verse 11. We're at Carolyn. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant misery and remember me and not forget your servant for Ephraim and Son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. On his head. And again, so we're told that. Um, this certain man, Elkanah, he goes with his wife, Hannah, and Penina. They went every year to worship the Lord Almighty in Shiloh. And while they are there, Hannah, in verse 11, is praying and calls the Lord by this name, the Lord Sabaoth. The Lord of hosts. Now, this is not the, the Lord of Sabbath. That's different. All right? That's Shabbat. This is Sabaot. All right? The Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. It's the first time that it occurs as a name, the name of the Lord. We see it several other times throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And we find it twice in the New Testament. We find it is over 260 times after this throughout the Old Testament. 260 times. The Lord Almighty. When you see the Lord Almighty, it's Yahweh. So that's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Sabaoth. And this is what it looks like in the Hebrew. Coming from the right to the left. Sabaoth. Uh, I'm just going to read for you what does the Bible mean when it calls God the Lord of hosts. It, it, God is first called the Lord of hosts here in 1 Samuel 1 and 3. Of course, the word Lord, capitalized, all capitalized, uh, refers to Yahweh, the self-existent, redemptive God. And the word hosts is a translation of the Hebrew Sabaoth, meaning armies, a reference to the angelic armies of heaven. Uh, so another way of saying Lord of hosts is God of the armies of heaven. And 
as we already mentioned, the NIV translates it as the Lord God Almighty or the Lord Almighty. It's interesting that this name first appears at the close of the period of the judges. There will be no other judges after Samuel. Eli is mentioned for us here in the first chapter, but he's going to be eclipsed by Samuel because Eli will die. His sons are going to die in chapter 4. And Samuel will then be the judge of Israel until such time as he anoints the first two kings of Israel. And of course, the first king being Saul and the second king being David. We looked at that back uh, when we looked at David to some degree. And when we saw that Saul was the first king, David the second, what was it that Saul represented to the people as their king, the first king? He was the king as opposed or in contrast to David. He was the king that the people wanted. Now they didn't say we want Saul as our king, but they said we want a king instead of you, God. We want to be like all the other nations. And so Saul represents the flesh, that which rules, that which wants to rule in place of God. So basically God said this is what you get when you reject me. And then Saul became this picture of the, the heart of the people so that in chapter 13, when Saul goes about his own uh, ideas, thinking that he needs to offer sacrifice because Samuel hasn't showed up yet, but this, he said, wait until the seventh day. And then um, Saul, on the seventh day, he starts to panic, and he decides, I can't wait any longer. But the seventh day is not yet ended. It's not yet passed. And he decides to take matters into his own hands, and he offers the sacrifice himself. No sooner does he finish offering the sacrifice, who shows up? Samuel. Samuel shows up because Samuel said, wait until the seventh day for me to come. Saul said, I can't wait any longer. And Saul speaks to him the word of the Lord, because you have rejected me, the Lord speaking, because you have rejected the Lord, the Lord has rejected you. And he's chosen a man after his own heart. And so the man that he has selected is David. And David then represents Jesus Christ, the Messiah who will come, the one who is after God's own heart. All right, so before we end up getting ahead of ourselves uh, too far, it, I'll read just a bit more here for you. Uh, Shiloh is where the Ark of the Covenant is located because that's where the tabernacle is at this point. So the Lord, he sits enthroned among the cherubim. That's what it's referred to with him being uh, the top of the Ark of the Covenant. So in 1 Samuel 4 and 4, we see the Ark of the Covenant there. We looked at this last week, this passage, Psalm 99. Do you remember looking at that psalm? And it speaks of that in verse 1. Why don't we go to Psalm 99 and verse 1. Psalm 99 and verse 1. Uh, Johnny, please. Let the earth shake. 
All right. So we see that in this instance, the Lord sits enthroned between the cherubim. And this is in reference to the Ark of the Covenant, which is according to Exodus 25 and, and um, verses 12 to 15, somewhere in, in that range. It might be a little bit past that, those sections of verses, where the Lord is speaking about the Ark of the Covenant, given the instructions for, to, for Moses on how, to, uh, on how to build the Ark. And he said, it's above the Ark, above this mercy seat, the atonement cover, that I will meet with you. He dwells between the cherubim. So that's his presence. This picture then is, is this picture of the army of the Lord that he commands, that there's nothing that has any authority or power or rule or influence that God does not have control over, even wicked powers, the powers of darkness, Satan and his hosts. doesn't matter what it is, what name, what power, what authority, God rules over it all because he is Yahweh Sabaoth, which is the Lord God Almighty. So he rules over everything. There's nothing that is outside of his rule and outside of his reign. Uh, the two references in the New Testament are in Romans chapter 9, for your reference, we won't be uh, addressing them specifically, but Romans 9, verse 29, and James 5 and verse 14. Uh, bring that to your attention simply because this is the only two places in the New Testament where this name specifically occurs. Romans 9, verse 29, James 5, and verse 14. It's interesting that this is the very name that David uses when he approaches Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. He says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, so David is, is on the battlefield with Goliath, and as he is about to charge the, the giant, David says to the Philistine, you come to me? with sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. I come to you in the name of Yahweh Sabaoth. It's this same name, at least uh, with this Sabaoth, that we find Jesus is introduced to us back in Joshua chapter 5, where Joshua has an encounter with a man that he doesn't know, uh, he hasn't recognized him as having encountered him before. He said, are you for us or against us? He says, no, but as the commander of the hosts of heaven, or the army of God, as commander of the Sabaoth. So it's not the Lord Almighty, the name, but we see the one who is the commander of these hosts, Jesus. So we find it, him there in Joshua chapter 5. And for your reference, for those that are taking notes, uh, I didn't mark down which verse that is, but it's in verse uh, 14. And 15. He said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua. So that's verses 14 and verse 15. So we see the connection there with the, uh, the Lord Almighty, we see, is Jesus Christ. Even before he comes in the flesh. We see a picture of him here in this passage throughout this book, not just for Samuel himself, but throughout the book. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 
where David, he, he even calls, he says, in, in the name of the Lord God, excuse me, Almighty, I, I come against you. So he's going he's gonna to have victory because of the Lord's strength, because of all that he's done. And, of course, this is why Hannah calls out, because she has no power or strength in herself, and she's been barren for years. And she calls out to the Lord Almighty, Lord God Almighty, my life is in your hands. The outcome of my life is in your hands. You have power to put, give life to my womb and make it fruitful or to withhold it. And so she calls out to the Lord Almighty and says, God Almighty, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but if you will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will come upon his head. And of course, we see that the Lord did remember her. We see it in verse 19 and down. We looked at that last week and how she names him Samuel, meaning God has heard. So I want to go down into chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Samuel has arrived. He now has been taken to Shiloh. He's been weaned. And now he's ministering uh, to the Lord before Eli the priest. So he becomes um, an assistant, if you will. He becomes a servant, so to speak. Not a slave, but he's, he's ministering on behalf of and at the instruction of Eli. So in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 11. Claire, would you mind reading that, please? 1 Samuel 2 and 11. And let's go down to verse 18 as well, if we can. So Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Verse 19 says, Moreover, his father made, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. When she came up with her husband, he always offered it at a yearly sacrifice. All right. So we see that he's ministering, being instructed and trained as a priest. We looked at it last week that he was a Levite of the Kohathites. Although living in the tribe of Ephraim, and there may have been a family connection there, uh, we find out that he is a Levite, ministering as one of those who would be responsible for the holy articles. So the, the pans, the table of showbread, the lampstand, the, alt, the golden altar of incense, and, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. And when these things were transported, they couldn't just transport them out in the open, uncovered. They, they were responsible to cover them in a specific way so that they didn't go in and see it and then cover them. They went in specifically to the Ark of the Covenant. They had the curtain or the uh, covering in front of them and they laid it over the Ark of the Covenant so neither they nor anyone else could see the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but if you look online or if you look at any depictions of the Ark of the Covenant that might be transported in the wilderness when Israel was 40 years in the wilderness and if they're, they're moving from one camp to another or um, any other instance that, you might be aware, that there might be a depiction of moving the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you will see the Ark of the Covenant gold box with the cherubim on top, but never is it covered. Anyone ever seen it covered? Can anyone ever think of pictures that you've seen of, of it being transported? And not only that, but if it's in color, it's all gold and shiny instead of 
gold and shiny, but covered in blood. That's a key element of the Ark of the Covenant, something that we keep, need to keep in mind, especially as it represents a picture of Jesus Christ. It's a type of Christ, that article, the Ark of the Covenant. We won't get into that further uh, in our study tonight, but wanted us to be aware of even in that respect. And Samuel is one who's not only a Levite in ministry, but he's a Kohathite, one of the uh, Levites who's responsible for transporting or the care of the holy articles, not least of which, or most important of all, I should say, is the Ark of the Covenant. So seeing even in, the, in his ministry, he's dealing with these types that are pointing toward Jesus, even in his ministry himself as a type of Christ. Because, of course, Jesus came to minister uh, as a judge, not at his first coming, but at his second coming, he will come as judge. He also served as a prophet during his earthly ministry. If you remember, the people would say, could this be the prophet? And, of course, Jesus did prophesy. He foretold things. And he not only foretold things, but what is, what is the role of a prophet besides just telling the future? What else does he tell? What more does he tell besides the future? There's, what is it? The word, yeah. So there's foretelling things that only God knows and because God does it. But there's also the telling forth of the things of God. So a prophet more often instructed, more often taught the things of God than he did telling things in the future. And that's sometimes something that we miss about prophets. When we think of prophets, we think of telling the future, predicting things. But prophets did that occasionally. More often than that, they instructed the people of the nature of God, instructed the people in the worship, how they were to, to uh, approach God and, and conduct their lives in light of the revealed word of God, the scriptures. We're going to come to that in just a minute for in chapter 12 of 1 Samuel about te the teaching aspect. But before we do that, I want us to get this idea about the priesthood. So we've got Eli, who is the high priest, and we've got his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. So by this time when we see Eli, he's an old man, quite old. And his sons are the ones that are doing most of the ministry, most of the work, in the tabernacle at this point. But his sons are corrupt. So I want to look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to read and looking at verses 22 to 25. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing through all Israel, how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. All right, so we see a picture of the the corrupt priesthood with Hophni and Phinehas. So Eli was one who, who served faithfully during his early years of, of the priesthood, but his sons, they've become corrupt and there's, there's been, they, they haven't been removed from their position of, of uh, influence, of leadership. They, they did unspeakable things, didn't they? They were, they were perverse, they were corrupt, they, they defiled the people that came to worship. They, they took the women that came to worship and they, they prostituted them in the things of God. They became pagan 
in, uh, in their approach to God. And we see a parallel here in this respect between Samuel and Jesus. Do you see the picture? What is the picture? Can you say that nice and loud? The priesthood was corrupt when Jesus came. When Jesus came, the priesthood was also corrupt in his time, in his day. They went after... Uh, the priesthood in Jesus' day were those that were in position because of political favors. Herod had put them in place because of things that they did some backroom negotiations and, and bribes and so on. And so they got put in their positions because of that type of influence. There is, there is, is some reason to believe that when, when Jesus was telling the, we're, we're, we read it as a parable about the rich man and Lazarus, and La they both died. Lazarus was escorted by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man was taken to Sheol or Hades. And he was in, in torment, in flames. And he said, please, Father Abraham, let Lazarus go back and warn my brothers. There's some that would look at that and say, Quite possibly, Jesus was likening this rich man to the priesthood because the number of brothers that or sons that uh, Annas had or Ananias had were the same number as this man uh, who, who had, uh, was it five brothers, I think it was? And we see the same picture, the parallel there in Jesus. Some look at that and say Jesus was speaking at the corruptness and the lavishness of the richness of the priesthood, the high priest, where they, they made sport, if you will, of devouring widows, their houses. They would take them for themselves, and then they would, they would get illicit gain. Whether or not that can be concretely or firmly connected, certainly the priesthood was corrupt during Jesus' day. How do we know that? What is the sure sign of a corrupt priesthood? Let me ask it this way. Who does the priesthood, the, priest, the priesthood of the Bible, of the temple in Jerusalem, who are they to serve? God. And as serving God and as representatives, as symbols of that one that would come to replace the sacrificial system. When the one who was the true, as opposed to their type, the symbolism, came, what did they do with him? What was their desire and ultimate result? Crucified. Crucified him. Kill him. Kill him. Every, every chance they had. What can we do? They schemed and they, they did what they could to try to determine the plot against Jesus. Well, this is what it's like during the time of Samuel. The priesthood is corrupt. Then we have a man who comes on the scene. He's a prophet. We find him... Um, in verse 27, 1 Samuel 2 and verse 27. Now, we're gonna, not going to read the entire aspect of what this man speaks here, but I do want to bring our attention to verse 27 and find out that a man of God came to Eli and said, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And then he starts to condemn the house of Eli and his sons and ultimately telling him that they are going to be cut off. Look at verse 31. 
Jeanne, could you read verse 31 for us? And then he continues in saying about the, those that seem to be coming into their prime in verse 33, they're, they're going to die. Uh, so basically, his family line is going to fade out. And no longer will they have a lineage of priests to continue. Even to the point that uh, Abiathar, the high priest, who was a descendant of Eli and served as a high priest, was replaced by Zadok during the time of David. At least there's indication that that was the case. But I want to look at one thing that's going on here in two things I want to see. In verse 30. So let's look at verse 30, all right? Louise, please. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy fathers shall walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and them and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So those who honor me I will honor. honor. The word here for honor in the Hebrew is kavad or kaved, kaved. And this is the word that we get the word kavod from, glory or glorify or splendor. So the glory of the Lord is referred to, is the word is kavod. And it comes from this word kavad, kaved. And the word literally means to have weight or substance. So he who gives substance to me or recognizes my weightiness, then I will give my weightiness to them. The one who, this is what it literally means. The one who honors me, I will honor. Or the one who recognizes and acknowledges my weightiness, I will take my weight and give it to them. But the one who, uh, who dishonors me or who despises me, I'm going to lightly esteem. In other words, I will reject. And I want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9. I want to see the connection here. 1 Samuel 9 and verse 6. Are we at Carolyn again? Do you see the connection? It's not easy right off the bat in English because it's a different word that's being used here. Uh, what does it say in the NIV back in, in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30? I, I, I uh, neglected to have a look at that. And I don't, you weren't reading from the NIV, were you? No. What is it? It says the same. So he who honors me, I will honor. All right. So we don't see a clear connection in English in 1 Samuel 9 and verse 6. But if you were to, to make an educated guess, what do you see as a connection there? Anybody? What is it? Highly respected. Highly respected. So there's a man here who is highly respected. Uh, the word in some translations is... Uh, he is an honorable man, or he is a man who is honored. And the word there is the same word that we find in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30. There is a man here who is kaved, a man here who is weighty. And why is he considered to be weighty? Because God had given his weightiness to Samuel 
because Samuel had acknowledged the weightiness of God. All of you, no doubt, are familiar with a, a forklift, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever run an op operate a forklift? Johnny has a forklift. You ever run a forklift? forklift? Yeah, no. never operated a forklift. Well, operating a forklift is this. Forklifts have weight lifting limits. If you're lifting something that weighs more than the forklift, what's going to happen to it once you lift that weight above its center of gravity, its point of balance? It's going gonna, it's gonna to go. And if you raise it too quickly, and that gets up high, it's just going to go quickly and hard. But you can do something with a forklift in order to increase its lifting capacity. And what do you do with it? You add weight, counterweights to the back end. They're called ballasts. You, you put extra weight in order to increase its lifting ability, increase its strength. And you can sort of get that same idea with the things of God. That you and I, we are featherweights. I mean, we weigh nothing on the scale when it comes to God, right? Like zero. We don't even register on the scale. But when we recognize God, when we honor God, when we see his kaved, which in a, is connected to his Kavod, his glory, his splendor, his majesty, that he takes of his kaved, his weight, and it's like he puts it on us so that now we've got stability. We've got, and this isn't weight that, that um, weighs us down and makes us burdened. This is weight that gives us substance. Do you understand the difference? It gives us stability, much like the forklift so that we can do now what we could not have done before. That we will be recognized as those, if you, if you will, uh, as those who have authority. Remember Jesus when he taught? Many times the people were told in response to his teaching, they were astonished or they were amazed because no one taught with such authority. And the picture there is with such weightiness with such kaved before. They haven't seen it because the, the, the kavod or of God, the splendor, the glory, the weight of God had not been on other teachers like they are, it is on this teacher, Jesus. In a similar sense, we see that with Samuel. Let's come back to 1 Samuel uh, chapter, chapter, three, uh, chapter 2. Uh, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's go into chapter 3, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1. I think we're at Johnny. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. This is when... Samuel was still a boy. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> There's one more line, phrase then. There was not many virgins. There was not many visions or revelation. It's, it's the same word. It's the word there that can be used and be translated as visions or revelation. It's much like in the book of Proverbs where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no revelation, the people perish, or they cast off restraint. With that being the case, it's this picture of uh, where there's no revelation or vision of God in his glory, in his weight, in his splendor and majesty, that the people are going to be, they'll just cast off restraint, they're going to end up perishing. So in Samuel, when he was a, a boy, there was not, uh, the word of the Lord was rare. 
However, we find that setting up for this situation when probably we, if you went to Sunday school, that this was one of the first one of the first stories you would learn from the Old Testament. Samuel in the tabernacle, and he hears somebody calling, and he thinks it's Eli, and he goes to him. Yes, I'm here. What what do you want me to do? I didn't call you. Twice it happened. He said, finally, if he realized it was the Lord, if you hear the voice again. Then say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Listen. Happened three times, and then on the fourth time, is that right? Yeah. So three times he came to Eli, and on the, on the third time he said, if he, if he calls you again, it's the Lord. Say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. On the fourth time, then the Lord calls out twice, repeats his name, Samuel, Samuel, or Shmuel, Shmuel. And he said, speak, Lord, for your servant Shema's. It's interesting that he, he takes a part of his name. He says, I'm listening to you. Speak, for I'm listening to you. The word of the Lord was rare, but while he's at this same age, even though the word is rare all around, what do we find out about Samuel? The word of the Lord, his ears are tuned to the word of the Lord. See, it's not that the word of the Lord was infrequent, at least in my estimation from what we see throughout Scripture, as much as it was that the hearing of the word of the Lord was infrequent. Because the Lord is always at work and he's always speaking, isn't he? He's always working and he's always speaking. But people are not always listening. They're not always doing what they are seeing the Father do. So he says, speak, for your servant is listening. Then we find out that uh, the Lord speaks to him, and he really gives him just a few more details about the prophecy that had come to Eli in chapter 2. And he, he gives him a few more details, and then Eli says to him in the morning, what did the Lord say? And Samuel is a little bit reluctant. Well, he's afraid to tell him in chapter 3 and verse 15. Uh, and he says, what did the Lord speak to you? Don't hold anything back. If you hide anything from me at all of the things that he said to you. And Samuel told him everything and he hold not, held nothing back. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So that's verses 16 through 18. So the word of the Lord was rare during that time. But Samuel has an ear for the things of God. And I want to look at verses 19 to 21. It's chapter 3, 19 to 21. And who are we at now? At Carolyn? Or, Claire. Sorry, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting that the Lord was with him and he didn't let any of his words fall to the ground. What does that speak of? Kaved, right? Weightiness. There was weight to his speech. And it was the same thing with Jesus. He let none of his words fall to the ground. There was kaved because he honored the Lord. And everybody in all of Israel knew that he was a prophet. And we're told that the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh, how? By the word of the Lord. So I thought the word of the Lord was rare. He's hearing what God is speaking. Then we find in the very next verse, chapter 4 and verse 1, and the word of the Lord, oh, excuse me, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Why? Because the Lord was speaking to Samuel and Samuel was bringing the word to Israel. To judge them. But words were rare, but they can also be translated valuable, precious, noble, and weighty. 
All right, valuable, noble, precious, and weighty, for the word of the Lord was rare. The word of the Lord was precious, it was noble, it was weighty, and it was valuable. valuable. The foundation stones, expensive building stones, the priesthoods, or the, the high priest breastplate stones were rare. Okay. So the word was rare. Speaking of preciousness, valuable, noble. And not many recognize it as that. And those who do, they are blessed, aren't they? But if we look at it as being rare, and why, why are things that are rare, why do we consider them to be precious? Because there's not, it, it's, there's not a lot of it, or, or what it is is, is so precious and so, so valuable, you, you, you hang on to it. I mean, if nobody goes around, um, I, I've got lots of dirt. I've got lots of, I mean, you can go to, to a beach, we're from PEI. You can go to a beach in PEI and get all kinds of sand, and I can come back and say, all right, who would like to, who, who would like to buy some sand? I'm selling it cheap. Anybody, anybody going to buy sand? What if I said I brought back sand for you? How many are you going to say, yes, I'll take, I'll take a, a bucket full of it? Nobody's going to do it because it's so common, right? It's not rare. It's not precious. It's not valuable. Now, if I came back from PEI and I said I found some diamonds, how many would like a diamond? These are big diamonds. Well, I mean, it's, this, this is, this, this is my, this is my uh, uh, illustration. This is my dream here for a second. <laughs> so in my dream, it works. Uh, but do you see, do you see the a parallel here? That when Jesus came, what was the word of God in that day? It was still precious and valuable and noble. It was still rare. But think in context for 400 years from the end of Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6 that the word of the Lord was rare. There weren't many visions. Not many people were tuned in to the voice of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, there's a voice that says, what? What does the voice say? When finally the silence is broken. All right, let's get some sequence here. The angel, Gabriel says, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. Silence has been broken, as it were. And so God speaks to Zechariah. And then um, God speaks to Mary. And then he speaks to Joseph. And then he speaks through John the Baptist. And then he speaks through Jesus. So it's not that there wasn't God speaking for those 400 years. It's just that it wasn't frequent. We don't have record of it. It doesn't mean that God wasn't speaking. We just don't have record written down of him speaking or what it was that he was speaking. So we see that that Samuel was faithful in contrast to the priesthood. You see the corruptness of the priesthood and Samuel was faithful. He was, he was honored by God. The priesthood was rejected, was despised. They were uh, lightly esteemed and that's what God did with the priesthood in Jesus' day. Let's come back to, to another passage here. Wow. Um, we were supposed to finish Samuel tonight. Okay, um, let's look at one more aspect here. I want to I want to check out in verse thirty one of First Samuel two. So still, this is the prophecy during Samuel's uh, boyhood. So thirty one, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And then he says. In verse 36, uh, verse 35, I'm going to raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a 
What is it? A sure house. What is it in other translations? I will, his house will be firmly established. So I will build him a sure house. His house will be firmly established. It's two ways of saying the same word, this idea of, of something that is sure. Um, I'm going to build him a faithful house. I'm going to build him a true house. And we find this word again in relation to the one that it's going to come through, and it's through David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. And as you're going there, I'm just going to continue reading. I'm going to build him a, uh, a sure house. He's going to do everything that is in my heart and my mind. I'll build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And anointed there is my Mashiach. My Mashiach. And what is Mashiach? In English, Messiah. My Messiah. So 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16. And I think we're at Deb. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16. And again, there's that word, established. Your throne will be established forever. Your kingdom will be established forever. It's this word. Um, here is that word that is being used. Um, If I can find it, here we go, yeah. It's the word, amen, 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 amen. So 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16 is where that is. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16. So looking at this, it's, I, it will be firmly established. He, it will be amen. It means faithful. It means true. He is Jesus. He is the faithful and true. He is the amen. We find that in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. He is the amen. He is the faithful and true in Isaiah 49 and verse 7. We won't go to all of these. Just if you're taking notes, you can write them down. Isaiah, Isaiah 49 and verse 7. Isaiah 65 and verse 16. And, and it's this picture of ruling and reigning in truth and faithfulness. So he's going to firmly establish. He's going to be the amen, truth, Truthful, faithful, and his anointed one. So he's speaking about not just uh, a priest that's going to come into position like Zadok in place of Eli, but he's speaking of one down the road, down the line, who will not only be a priest, but also will be a king. And he's going to establish his house. And what is his house? It's you and me. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6 says that he is a he is a faithful high priest in all of his house. He's built up his house. So it's speaking about Jesus. Pardon me? Hebrews 3 and verse 6. Are you right there, Deb? No? Okay. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just read Hebrews 3 and verse 6 uh, once again. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the, of the hope firm to the end. So he's building us up as this house, firmly establishing us as his house, him being the high priest.
So he contrasts Samuel with the priesthood. And he says of these, of Hophni and Phinehas, he says they are worthless men. Or he says they are sons of Belial. Depends on your translation. But sons of Belial. And that literally means sons of Satan. But Belial can be translated as worthless. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. I'm not sure who we're at for reading it at the moment. At GN. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 15. So what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? There's no harmony between a believer and an unbeliever. What, what harmony is there between Christ and somebody who is worthless? What is something that is worthless? It's speaking about one that has no weight, substance. Um, it would be, when you think of substance and weight, let me give you just a little bit of uh, another illustration. Uh, I remember as a kid, when at Easter, when we would get chocolate Easter's, Easter bunnies, we used to get the hollow ones. Yeah, so they were without substance. I mean, they tasted good, but you took a bite and they broke and crumbled and so on. Then I met Debbie, and her family got solid Easter bunnies, chocolate bunnies. And they were ones that had substance, like there was weight to them. There was hers, and there was mine. Mine was bigger. But it was empty and it was lighter. <laughs> and there was substance to hers. Then I started buying my own. <laughs> Hard to, you can't compare it, of course, the substance, the weightiness of God, but it gives you a picture of something that's not hollow. There's substance, there's, there's weight. So speaking about the one who comes and brings truth, let me, I just want to bring a quick comparison to you. No, that's, uh, that's for Hebrew geeks. If you want, I'll do that at the end. And if you want to stick around for it, then it is interesting. But for the sake of time, I'll leave that uh, for now. And uh, I'll come back to it. And then if you want to, to stick around, you're welcome to. Otherwise... All right, so 1 Samuel, let's go on to chapter 12, or it's chapter 7. 1 Samuel, chapter 7. Just want to bear out a couple of more comparisons of, of these types with Samuel and Christ. So 1 Samuel 7, 7 to 12. And we're at Louis. When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the Lord of the Philistines, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that we will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited, mm -hmm. discomfited. discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they, until they came unto Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, mm -hmm. saying, Hither, Hither to has the Lord helped us. So discomfited means to confused or threw into confusion. Discomfited means confusion. Um, and this is a picture then of the, the people of Israel they're being afflicted, they're being overcome by their enemies, the Philistines, 
And what does Samuel take? He takes a lamb. He takes a lamb and a suckling lamb. So this means in its first year. And offered as a whole burnt offering. It's a picture of, of Christ who he, well, there, there's great thunder that the Lord brings against, um, against the people of the Philistines. Um, it, God brings strength to the people of Israel. And it's a picture of Jesus who demonstrates complete control over the elements of nature. And he offers himself wholly or completely unto the Lord. And he brings about the defeat of Satan, the enemy of Israel, and of course the enemy of the Gentiles as well. Then chapter 12. For Samuel chapter 12. I spoke about earlier about um, him being a teacher. Samuel being one who taught the word of God. The word of God was in his mouth. And by this time, the people had now asked for a king to be put over them. They want it to be like all of the other nations. And Samuel is bringing the people's minds back at, at Saul's coronation. And he said that you, as long as you sought the Lord, he brought you uh, into the land. You enjoyed victory over your enemies. You enjoyed God's blessing as long as, as you were obedient to the law, as according to the law had said. And he said, as a sign of the truthfulness of his statement, he calls for thunder and lightning and rain during the season where there is no rain. This is in verses 16 to 18. So I'll, I'll read it here for the sake of time. So he says, uh, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? Which means we are in the dry season. It's not the rainy season. I'm going to call to the Lord and he's going to send thunder, thunder and rain so that you may perceive and see that your wickedness in, is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So we see there's a picture of even of, of Jesus here who has power over all of the elements of the world. And then what do we see Samuel does? In verses 20 to 22, he instructs them according to the word of the Lord, telling them, don't fear. And then down in verse 23, after he says that I'm not going to stop praying for you, then he says, but I'm going to teach you the good and the right way. I'm going to teach you to walk in the ways of the Lord. Then chapter 15. We'd already touched on chapter 13. Saul is rejected by the Lord because he'd rejected him and Samuel is used once again in order to anoint the king whom God has selected who is a picture of Jesus David himself a man after his own heart so chapter 15 Samuel gives the word of the Lord to Saul and he says go against the Amalekites and kill everything and everyone don't keep man or woman or, or uh, um, beast alive. Everything is to be put to the sword. But what did Saul keep alive? The king. The king, and sheep. sheep, and some cattle. And he uses it. It sounds good. He said, I, the people suggested, they, they insisted that we keep the, um, the animals for a sacrifice to the Lord. But Samuel says, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. Um, to heed or to listen, to, to do what God has, has asked is better than the fat of rams. 
because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And so again, he says, because you have rejected the Lord, the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. But what does Samuel do in the meantime? He's an old man by this time. What does he say? Bring Agag here. He took a sword and he ran him through. He put Agag to death. And it's a picture where Jesus was, was considered to be weak. There wasn't, people looked at him, especially the, the rulership, the leadership of Israel, considered him to be weak, Jesus. And they wanted to put him to death. But what did Jesus do? He took that which was considered to be weakness and foolishness, as Paul says about the cross. And what did he do? He ran the king of the Amalekites through. Agag, if you will. Satan destroyed him at the cross. He cut him to pieces. And when Jesus, before he gave up his spirit or breathed his last, he said, it is finished. In other words, he, he gave the death blow to Satan. And then in chapter 16, which is one of the last times we see Samuel until the latter um, time of his death. And what do we see that he's doing in chapter 16? He's carrying out that which he told Saul that God had chosen, a man after his own heart. And we see him coming to Bethlehem. And he chooses, or he, he anoints God's choice for king in place of Saul. And of course, we see Jesus born in the same town that David was from. And he becomes the one, or he comes as the one, who will rule and reign, who will sit on the throne of his father David. He's not yet done that, has he? But he will when he returns. In Revelation 19, he's coming to rule and reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And as king of kings, he's going to rule from Jerusalem on the throne of his father David. In other words, the kingdom that God promised to give to David and his house, that he's going to establish his house, affirm, establish firmly. It's a sure thing. And it's through Jesus Christ that it is accomplished and carried out. Ruling and reigning in righteousness. Righteousness. 